Um, I'm Professor Huhtamo from the uh, uh, UCLA Department of Design Media Arts. And um, tonight it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce you uh, our guest speaker in this our soundscape lecture series, uh, Bill Fontana from San Francisco. Uh, Bill is really uh, one of the uh, true pioneers uh, of media arts, particularly working with sound and uh, sound in, uh, in spaces. Um, and um, so Bill Fontana has worked for the past 30 years creating installations that use sound as a sculptural medium to interact with and transform our perceptions of visual and architectural settings. Um, his works have been installed in public spaces and museums around the world, including cities like San Francisco, New York, Paris, London, Berlin, Venice, Sydney, and Tokyo. Um, Bill sound sculptures use the human and or natural environment as a living source of musical information. He assumes that at any given moment there will be something meaningful to hear and that music in the sense of coherent sound patterns is a process that is going on constantly. Uh, his uh, methodology has been to create networks of simultaneous listening points that relay real-time acoustic data to a common listening zone, or, which is the sound sculpture site. And since 1976, uh, Bill has called his works sound sculptures. I think he was the person who coined this word. And um, now, since the late 1990s until the present, Bill's project have explored hybrid listening technologies of acoustic microphones, underwater sensors, which he calls hydrophones, and structural material sensors, accelerometers. He has also realized and is developing project that access live seismic networks to explore the sound energy of ocean waves traveling long distances underground. So please help me welcome Bill Fontana. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I started out in the 60s as a, uh, as a composition student and became interested in how the world makes music, how the uh, real situations generate m musical patterns. And I knew John Cage pretty well in New York in the, uh, in the late 60s and began to <coughs> carry a tape recorder with me wherever I went so that whenever I heard something interesting, whenever I felt there was a moment that I'd encountered where the world seemed musical to me, I could make a recording of it. Uh, but it was kind of a hard in those days to think of earning a living doing that. It was an, and I was lucky in the early 70s. I went to Australia and got a job with the Australian Broadcasting Company. And my job was to basically record, document what Australia sounded like. Uh, from the early 70s, like 1973, to the late 70s. I got paid to listen and travel around Australia and record it. And that was a real turning point in my life, because when I left New York, I was a young artist with a lot of ideas and not very much money. And you know, going to Australia and getting paid to listen and investigate those landscapes was really a great sort of chance for me to develop as an artist. But the most memorable kind of listening moment I had in Australia, which in some ways really changed me, was to be in a rainforest during an eclipse of the sun. Because everybody thinks of an eclipse as a, you know, as a visual experience. And uh, I was in this rainforest, and I'm going to play you about 10 minutes of this, 10 minutes of this, uh, recording.
because it's a really nice way to start. But you have to imagine that this begins uh, a few minutes before it becomes totally dark in this rainforest, and before the, total the moment of totality, the rainforest is full of sparkling shadows, and the birds uh, don't know what's going on, and they all birds in the morning and the birds in the evening, they all start singing at the same time. And then when the eclipse comes, it's like suddenly somebody turning a light off and it gets very quiet. And you can just hear in the recording the rainforest going from this frenzied activity to become, suddenly becoming very quiet. And this sort of sense of uh, time and real time and, and uh, sound recording is a medium to investigate the nature of a moment uh, has been something that stayed with me all this time. But this was recorded in 1976 in southeastern Australia. Sorry, I'm going to start this again.
How's that? Okay. Another uh, Australian, another Australian recording uh, that I really regard as my first sound sculpture was a, a, a recording that was a real-time sound mapping uh, recording that was made in Sydney Harbour of the uh, rhythmic events that were taking place within a floating concrete pier in Sydney Harbour. Uh, the pier was made of concrete and was made buoyant by a, a series of vertical cylindrical holes that were drilled into it. And the waves at the bottom of the floating pier would, would close the uh, bottom ends of these cylindrical holes. And when I put microphones inside of these cylinders, it, you could hear these really remarkable rhythmic events. In the middle of the night, uh, also in 1976, I brought an outside broadcast truck to Kirribilli Wharf in Sydney and made an eight-channel recording of uh, eight of these uh, cylindrical holes uh, in Kirribilli Wharf. And this was then later played as a sound installation in a number of places in Australia and then later at the Whitney Museum in New York in the mid-80s. So you have to imagine that the ideal way to hear this would be from eight speakers you're hearing a stereo mix of it, but you can imagine this is a real-time uh, spatial recording living in Australia, I had access to an outside broadcast truck from the ABC, so I had the chance to make a lot of uh, eight-channel field recordings, uh, which were 
recordings that mapped uh, kind of spatial complexity of sounds in, in the real environment. Um, this way of working evolved by the late 70s and early 80s into an interest in doing real-time sound pieces where I would place microphones in a landscape and connect them to a transmission system and send the sounds in real time to an architectural space that bore some conceptual uh, relationship to where the sounds were coming from. Early 1980, I moved to San Francisco and did a project for a music festival called New Music America in 1981, which was a real-time live sound map for San Francisco Bay. I was fascinated by the acoustics of the bay, and particularly how the sounds of the fog horns from the Golden Gate Bridge could travel through the bay. So at that time, I set up uh, microphones at eight different places around San Francisco Bay, and and the transmission network that I used was uh, an old radio station technology. They were called broadcast telephone lines. They were equalized to 15 kilohertz bandwidth, and they transmitted to, uh, to loudspeakers that were on the exterior of a pier building at Fort Mason in San Francisco Bay, so that the acoustic ambience of Fort Mason kind of became part of the piece that I was transmitting from other parts of the bay, and I was interested in the natural acoustic delays. So this uh, recording, I'll play for you, and I have some visuals I'll show you with it. The sound quality of it, uh, by t to my ear today, has a kind of all old radio quality to it. I was using an old radio transmission technology. But think of the idea that was happening here.
can go back to Antoine. That's cool. Okay, it's just going to go back. Um, this was 1981. In 1982, I did another project in the San Francisco area that was called Sound Sculpture with a sequence of level crossings because there's an area in uh, Berkeley where you have a sequence of intersections where uh, trains, Amtrak and Southern Pacific trains are required to blow their whistles. And because the intersections were close together, the uh, microphones could hear the front of the Doppler shift with the whistle and the back of the Doppler shift at the same time. And uh, I was interested in, in this uh, phenomenon of the moving train in the landscape and in the, in the simultaneity of the Doppler shift. To me, it sounded like a harmonica imitating a train. Uh, this was transmitted to loudspeakers that were also on the top of the building in Oakland that faced uh, Lake Merritt called the Oakland Auditorium so that this train became a train in the sky rather than a train in the ground. And because it was a real-time transmission, unlike the continuous sound of foghorns or the sea or anything, there were lots of natural silences in this because trains were very intermittent. Uh, train whistles were a very intermittently occurring sound. So every so often there would be this uh, train in the sky, like a billboard, a sonic billboard going across the top of this, of this building. And again, the, the sound quality of this, because it was transmitted through analog telephone lines in 1982, has that sort of flavor of an analog telephone line.
1983, I did a project in New York for the centenary of the Brooklyn Bridge, which uh, was also a real-time project. It was installed, uh, used a sound that the Brooklyn Bridge made that no longer exists. In 1983, it had a steel grid roadway that droned, it oscillated, and when cars drove over it, <clears throat> it would make this wonderful humming sound. I thought it was wonderful, and not everyone probably liked it as much as I did. But the sound was transmitted to a building that no longer exists. It was transmitted to, to loudspeakers that were placed inside about 100 feet off the ground in the facade of One World Trade Center so that the humming of the Brooklyn Bridge was floating above the big plaza below the World Trade Center. And this was done in 1983. So the sequence I'll show you on the DVD, uh, you'll see some, sometimes you'll hear the sound and just see an occasional image of either the bridge or part of the World Trade Center where this was. And this was also an eight channel, originally an eight channel piece so that the oscillations of the bridge were kind of phasing and moving kind of in above the surf, in the facade above the plaza below it. this remote. I'm trying to get over here.
So in, in about, and I think it was 19, late 1980s, the book, the Brooklyn Bridge road surface was paved over, so the grid was gone. And uh, when the sound was played there, you can just see the speakers poking out between the struts of the World Trade Center. You couldn't tell how high above you the sound was, so it really gave you this sense of kind of hovering above you in that, in that space. Just trying to get back to the. Oh, to the main menu. To the main menu. This is where I want to go. Thanks. Um, 1984, I did a project in Berlin um, called Distant Trains. It was in design for the ruin of the famous train station called the Anhalter Bahnhof. In Berlin in the uh, early 1980s was quite a different place than it is today. It was, uh, this was kind of a weird, desolate, forgotten place near the wall. People would walk their dogs in a large empty field right behind the ruin of the station. But imagine how strange it would be in New York if Grand Central Station, a pen station, were just an empty lot kind of abandoned. Um, that's how strange this place was in uh, 1984. So a, the sound sculpture involved burying loudspeakers in the empty field behind the room of the station and reconstructing the busiest contemporary German train station, the main train station of Cologne. And that's why it's called Distant Trains, distant from Berlin and sort of distant as a sort of memory as a station. I'm sorry that I have all these problems with this DVD player, but just bear with me on this.
Do you want to switch? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? Um, the I'm interested in the circumstance that the World Trade Center. Um, was the sun announced in any way? Was it at certain hours? It was a public art project, and so there was a lot of publicity around it. It, w it was done for the centenary of the Brooklyn Bridge, and it, was, it existed there as an installation for several months. And uh, the, the announcement was graphic. There were posters. There was press. There was an opening. Uh, WNYC in New York did live radio hookups to it. Was it 24 hours? It was 24 hours, yeah. And uh, so certainly there must have been plenty of people who didn't see the announcements and, and so forth. Well, yeah, that, but that was interesting, actually, to me, that because there were a lot. Of, there were people who came in who, who at first had no idea, you know, what they were hearing. And it was just this strange, mysterious sound sort of hovering above the building. And some people uh, thought it was the, the building actually making, making the sound. And given the nature of the sound, it was plausible you know, that maybe this strange architecture and the wind, the wind pr yeah. produced a sound like that. Kids used to like it. They, kids were particularly interested in it. But it, um, it, it, it it was it was installed as a sculpture in, in the space, sound sculpture. And I was interested in playing with the scale of the building, having the sound above you, but you couldn't exactly locate how far above you it was. You had a question? Yes, I did. Uh, pertaining to the same project, could you describe your process in terms of how you went about developing the technology to actually pick up the vibration from the bridge itself? Um, this was 1983, and the transmission technology was uh, broadcast to telephone lines, which are 15 kilohertz lines. The pickups I used were acoustic microphones that were suspended below the roadway of the bridge. You know, if I was doing that project today, I'd be using very different technology than I had then. You know, today I've recently been doing a lot of work with accelerometers, which are the scientific version of the contact microphone. And I would have probably used technology like that then had I known then what I know now. But then I was using acoustic microphones that were suspended below the roadway. So I uh, <coughs> cabled on a main, the main catwalk at the Brooklyn Bridge, which is below the pedestrian promenade of the bridge. So the kind of natural motion and phasing of the cars you know, made the made the patterns. Yes. Um, the last <clears throat> one, the distant trains. Yeah. Did you say that that was playback or was that also broadcast? That was broadcast. It was broadcast. But it was that was a more complicated broadcast because it was coming from West Germany to to West Berlin, which was a, at that time a political island inside of East Germany. And the reason I was able to do that is I partnered with a radio station in Cologne, which dealt with all the sort of political, technical issues of that. Yes. Do you find it more <clears throat> coincidence or more intent that you so often work with vehicles and like things traveling through space? Um, well, I'm going to play play you some things that um, maybe. T explore some different things. I'm fascinated by structures that generate sound. I'm fascinated by bridges. I'm gener fascinated by how physical structures uh, kind of uh, absorb sound energy, transmit sound energy. Uh, I mean, it's something I've been interested in for years. But it's not, I'm interested in the natural environment as well. Multiple 
channels and eight channels of sound. Now, are these separate channels? Do you have separate sound beats going through each one? Yes. Yes, I do. So do. I'm sorry in this room I'm not able to play them for you that way because you're getting a very flat so sort of sound image of that. I'm really interested in the time period when you were working in Berlin and there were other sound artists like Bill <coughs> Mabre and Christina Kubitsch and you all seem to be using loudspeakers. I'm, I'm interested in that history. And this history of loudspeakers, well, you know, the loudspeaker is uh, in some ways the most important piece of uh, the kind of auditory puzzle because it's what you hear in the end and how you embed a loudspeaker in a building or a landscape to me is in some way it's the most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting parts parts of it. And, you know, the piece in Berlin would have been totally different if I had taken a couple of speakers and hung them on some buildings, you know, around there. But the fact that they were in the ground in the same physical position that the rails were, and uh, they were embedded in that earth, uh, gave you a, a relationship to that that was uh, like, very special. And people, it really created the illusion that it was a, a living station, especially since you didn't immediately see them. You couldn't tell really where the sound was coming from. And it was eight channels, the sound was moving. Uh, and people who had met, in 1984, there were still people alive who remembered that as a living station. And for them, it was very strange to go there and, because they would hear it from a distance and I think it was, it somehow come to life again as a station. But they, but I think the, how you, to me, how you place a loudspeaker in an architecture, how you put it in a situation is a very important uh, question. Often I'll start projects before I even think about what sound I'm gonna play. I'll just look at a, look at a, a space and just think of the architecture and kind of inscribing it with sound. Awesome. Yeah. Could we'll it follow up on that? Um, about the site specificity. Yes. Uh, especially with the Foghorns project, you yes. had installed at SF MoMA as well as in a public space, I believe, originally. And how do you feel about that? That the original installation was placed in a public space and dealt with, let's say, public architecture and then reappropriating it to a museum, for example? Um, I think that they're, they're very different experiences. The, I mean, the public space is interesting because you get the audience is so different. I'll show you some other projects uh, that were done that, that never got into museums that were in public spaces. But the dynamic in a public space is that you get an audience, you get two audiences, you get the people who know what it is and the people who don't know what it is. And the people who don't know what it is um, have to th think about it in a way that they, you know, they're confronted in a way by the sound. Because the sounds are placed there in such a way that they could maybe naturally be living there, but they're not naturally living there. I mean, the art of it is to put it in the space in such a way that it's almost believable as a sound that's really there, even though it's coming from far away. And then it, I, one of the reasons I've been so interested in relocating sounds and treating sounds as found objects is that um, in our culture, people don't hear sound. You know, we insulate ourselves from sound. We, today we have iPods and headphones and we have soundtracks, but we don't, we tune out really what we call the noise around us. And I'm interested in trying to kind of break that up. And I think one of the ways it happens, and one of the w ways culturally that people don't listen, is that we learn to associate uh, sounds with a certain visual identity. And you know, we, I, we're uh, on a, walking down the street and there's cars. So we tune that out and we don't hear the cars. But if you were to place another sound out there that shouldn't be there, it could be the sound of water, it could be something else is out of that context, you, that 
tuning out mechanism doesn't work so well and you have to, um, you know, you can't ignore it as easily. I, I'll show you a project I did in Paris that was done in the noisiest place in Paris at the Arc de Triomphe, which is an island in the center of a big traffic circle. And I took the sound of the sea from Normandy and wrapped the Arc de Triomphe in the sound of the sea. You couldn't see that the speakers were camouflaged pretty much as they had to be because of the nature of that monument. But the, uh, the sound was very visceral and present and you couldn't hear the traffic anymore because it masked the, the sound of the traffic by being natural white noise. And if you think of that place, I mean, sure, the Ministry of Culture sponsored this and there's all this art publicity, but there's a much bigger audience of tourists who were going there every day, thousands of tourists. They didn't know what the heck this was. You know, they go up there and all of a sudden it sounds like the seaside. And that kind of uh, interaction is really interesting because you're getting people to think about something that they wouldn't think about and pay attention to. And, um, I wanted to play you, show you a piece that I did in San Francisco in 1987 that was a duet between the Golden Gate Bridge and the Farallon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, which is 30 nautical miles west of the bridge. I did this uh, for SF MoMA for the anniversary, 50th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge, but it wasn't placed in the museum, it was placed on the facade of the museum in a plaza that uh, it shared with the San Francisco Opera. And to me, it was much more impressive to put it outside on the exterior of the building than actually in the building.
I want to uh, talk about, uh, I was talking about the project in Paris, so I'm going to show you the presentation about the Paris project. And on this presentation, you're actually going to hear, hear my voice talking about it. So I'm just going to let, let the, the presentation uh, speak for itself on this. Sound Island from the French Ministry of Culture at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Il Sonore, as it was called, was realized as three simultaneous installations on the three different levels of the monument. The two underground access tunnels had the live underwater gurgling sounds transmitted from a hydrophone submerged off a buoy in the English Channel. ground level, loudspeakers were hidden on the facade of the ark, and the live natural white sounds from the breaking waves of the Normandy coast engulfed the monument. This also had the effect of masking the formidable traffic noise surrounding Paris's busiest traffic circle. The sounds of the crashing waves also spilled out onto the large boulevard surrounding Place Etoile. On the third level is an observation deck where visitors have one of the most impressive visual panoramas of Paris, and I explored the idea of hearing as far as one could see. I placed microphones at 16 different locations, including the Opera, the Bourse, the Louvre, the Sacre Coeur Cathedral, various lively Parisian cafes, and many others. Visitors could hear individual locations as well as a rich collage of the sound landscape of Paris. This idea of hearing uh, as far as you could see uh, became really interesting to me. I first became aware of this actually uh, when I was living in Japan in the late 80s uh, because in the design of uh, Japanese gardens in Kyoto, they had this idea of borrowed landscape where they would, the, the visual design of a garden would frame the view of something in the distance. So the first time I did an installation exploring this sonically was actually in Kyoto, uh, where I did an installation on a mountaintop with a view landscape, and I transmitted sounds to that. But um, in 
some years after the Paris project in Venice in 1999 during the Venice Biennale, I did another project uh, about the idea of, of acoustical viewing of a landscape. It's called Acoustical Visions of Venice. And uh, I, I'm talking on this as well, so I'll let that just explain it.
project in Venice was also a real real time uh, installation and uh, what was the most startling moments of it occurred when uh, especially at the times when the bells in Venice were ringing because you could naturally hear the acoustic sounds of the bells standing you know on this on the Degana and uh, it would become multi-dimensional when the bells rang because you would hear the transmitted sounds before the natural sounds so you, you, and when the bells weren't ringing you just get this ambience of Venice and you might not pay much attention to it all of a sudden it would be very, very startling you get the sense of entering some kind of wormhole acoustic wormhole or something this uh, is really fun I'm gonna skip uh, some things uh, because we're, I don't want to keep going on too long and I wanted to play part of a piece I had done in London uh, in 2004 uh, which is a piece that was originally commissioned by uh, what, an institution that was called the Parliamentary Works of Art Committee of the House of Commons London and it, that committee normally is in the business of uh, commissioning artists to paint portraits of dead people, uh, most, mostly dead government people. But they asked me to do a sound piece, a portrait of their famous clock, Big Ben. And I was really interested in Big Ben as an acoustic icon because um, it's the kind of symbol of time and it's one of the most famous sounds in the world. And I wanted to create a piece that made it impossible to tell time with Big Ben anymore. And, and the way uh, that I did this was uh, I first of all had live microphones up in the bell tower and an accelerometer on the clockwork mechanism. And the sounds uh, were transmitted through a matrix mixing system that created this uh, composition that generated a series of time delays to every live event. So everything <laughs> happened eight times, eight different times, and the durations of time slowly changed over the course of the day, and all these different delays were moving in space. And this was installed live in a colonnade that was uh, below the Tower of Big Ben, so it interacted with the natural ambience of uh, Big Ben. You could, and it just basically made, meant that Big Ben was making music with itself. Um, it was kind of confusing though for the MPs who were walking along there looking at their watches try, trying to get to their, their meetings. But uh, <clears throat> this DVD is kind of strange because the images are, are really very static and so occasionally it'll change but I mostly just want you to hear what it sounded like. And this was, this was called Speeds of Time.
I was just wondering if you could talk in regard to that piece a, a little bit about the digital mixing matrix that you referred to and how you constructed that and um, just how that was conceived and, the impl and how it was uh, implemented. Well, it was conceived because uh, I was uh, really fascinated conceptually about uh, time and the nature of time and I, had, I was thinking also that 2004 was very close to the centenary of Einstein's uh, birth and I was thinking about the theory of relativity and the idea about as you approach the speed of light, you know, the, the time changes and, and, I, and I guess I was thinking that there's, time is not as, not as certain as the people in the 19th century who made Big Ben would like to have thought. And then I thought it would, of the idea of basically Big Ben making music with itself. And I thought about also walking around in London and going to the rooftops of buildings in the center of London and listening to how the sound of the bells of Big Ben traveled through the city and had this fantasy about setting up microphones on the rooftops of buildings throughout the center of London and hearing the natural acoustic delays of the sound of the bells traveling through London. So I kept thinking about all of this stuff. and. When I got down to it in Westminster, I used a matrix mixer, which is a device that you can program to spatialize uh, sound. You can create a speaker map where you kind of tell the, the matrix mixer how many speakers you're putting in a space, how far apart they are. And then you can create orbits, you know, with the, the inputs, live inputs coming into it so that uh, the live inputs can can move through the speaker map that you've created. And then in this matrix, you could also assign time values to either the input signals or the output signals. And I varied the time values of the, out, of the output signals so that each uh, output channel had a certain time value. And I could change that over the course of a day because this was running all the time. and. Uh, and it was very simple in a way because you couldn't tell uh, what was the first tick of the clock or the first strike of the bell. You know, and, and the idea in something like Big Ben is that you know exactly what the time is because you can count on, on that. And it, it was interesting a uh, place to work because uh, the BBC has transmitted the sound of Big Ben since it started broadcasting in 19. 23, and there's still BBC microphones in the bell tower of Big, of Big Ben, and twice a day they still broadcast the time time signal. But when I did the when I did the piece, they um, there's a, a news program in London called PM on the BBC, and it's a six o'clock uh, news program, uh, and they uh, they had some fun, you know going from the actual new, their, their version of Big Ben and my version of Big Ben. Any other questions? I'll ask you another question. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> as you, um, you just have a wonderful sense for combining these these different at these different environments, and I'm wondering if you could describe um, that process as you find yourself out in the world and you notice these things grab your attention. Could you describe the process of, in terms of how you decided, say, with the uh, with the the duet piece with the the bridge and the uh, um, I believe it was Farallon Island. Yes. How did how did that? Could you just describe how that came together for you a little bit in that process yeah, in general? Well, the, the music, the SF MoMA asked me to do a project for the 50th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge, so I spent a lot of time looking at the Golden Gate Bridge and listening to the Golden Gate Bridge. And when I was walking on the bridge on a very clear day, I looked west, and I could see this little pyramid of an island off in the far distance, directly in line with. The bridge, and I just did some research about it and found out that it's the westerly limit of San Francisco. If you look at a topographical map of San Francisco, you'll see the Farallon Islands are still in San Francisco County, and uh, they're a national wildlife refuge. You need a permit 
to go there. They're very protected. And they are an incredible marine habitat. And so the idea of um, kind of listening to these together seemed much more interesting to me than just listening to the bridge. And, and it, was just, it was an incredible adventure you know, to do that. This was done in 1987. And the, the transmission from the Golden Gate Bridge was pre, is a pre-digital transmission. So that was still telephone lines. But the Farallon Islands didn't have telephone lines. So Pacific Bell, which was the predecessor of SBC, went out, went out to the Farallons with me in a sailboat. And they put a microwave transmitter on the top of an automated lighthouse. And uh, they used a, it was a video microwave link. And they used a multiplexer to, uh, you know, so I could hook up multi-channel sound from, you know, from the Farallons. So they transmitted that to Twin Peaks and then relayed that to SF Mama. But the whole, the whole experience of doing that was, of course, like amazing and just getting going to that island and working on the Golden Gate Bridge and climbing all over the parts of the bridge. You saw some of the pictures. <coughs> yeah. So so the process of sort of starting somewhere and sort of just kind of following one's uh, sort of artistic instincts, I guess. Yeah. So um, so one, one piece you haven't mentioned here happened to be one that I, I participated in uh, many years ago. It was uh, actually at Ars Electronica 1989, which is a radio piece, which was called uh, music, music with Everyday Objects, right. uh, I think, which is in interesting in the sense that it is sort of like a little bit different in its approach than these, these other, right. these, these, these sound sculptures here. So, I was just wondering, uh, would you like to briefly talk, talk about yeah, the uh, music for music with everyday objects uh, piece? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a recording of it with me, but uh, that was an audience participation uh, radio piece. I had done it once uh, in Australia when I was working at the ABC, and I did it at Ars Electronica. And I had set up in a studio uh, a... a uh, a predecessor to a matrix mixer. It was explained the same idea, but it was a series of, of tape loops between uh, real, real to real uh, t tape recorders uh, that would. Uh, um, I used to. I would, I would take two real to real tape recorders and make a big loop that connected the machines so that one was, was recording and one was playing back later and uh, set up this network of tape delays in the studio and people would call in sounds. And uh, it was re really, uh, all the sounds came from people calling them in. I have a memory and there, many of the sounds were like people <laughs> clinging their, their beer glasses. Right. Because people were sitting in the pubs in the Austrian style, so, the, so they, they would ring in that, that beer glass. I, I remember that the sound was at times was much like orchestra of some people <coughs> clinging on the beer glasses and then transmitting that through telephone to the, right. to the radio studio. We also had peep, some people like yourself in the studio making, making noise. question um, about performance because looking at your work it seems like there would be um, it seems like looking at your work there should be some kind of natural connection between um, the sounds that you create and um, like live performance and I'm wondering if you've been approached by performance artists maybe dancers or something or have had any collaborations of that kind um, I have a little bit and, and I've actually uh, I mean because I, I started life out as a composer you know, and I still possess the ability to write, write music, although I don't do it very often. And I had the chance in, um, in Birmingham, England, to do a sound piece with a church in Birmingham that uh, is, has the distinction of having the largest peal of bells in the UK. In, in England, they do change ringing, which the bells are on wheels, and they have a team of ringers who each one is pulling a rope, and they ring them in sequence, and they have these very elaborate mathematical scores. But the problem with this church, beautiful Norman church of 
you know, from the 14th century, was that it had, be, it had become encased in architecture. It was surrounded by high buildings and shopping malls and busy roads, and you couldn't hear the bells. So I, I thought that the uh, change ringing method, which is very beautiful when you can hear it, wasn't successful in the acoustic conditions of uh, Birmingham. So I, I, worked, I actually wrote a piece for these bells that uh, explored the idea of uh, them ringing in clusters. I can actually play that for you. Would you like to hear part of that? And, and the idea of this composition was just to create a piece that would generate these big kind of clusters of sound out of these traditional change ringing bells so that the sounds of the bells could overcome the urban obstacles of traffic noise and architecture and travel through the city. This is too long to play here. your question. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I'm wondering if there's uh, if there was a anything that um, marked your transition from traditional composer to working with sound sculptures or sound installation type work. Yeah, I th I remember you know, I grew up in Cleveland and I was. Uh, within walking distance to the Cleveland Orchestra. And I was, music was part of my mythology as a child. And I, when I was a teenager, I started taking, studying composition with one of the associate conductors of the Cleveland Orchestra. And there was a beautiful park outside of Severance Hall where the orchestra was that I used to wait for my lesson. And I was, I used to find the sounds in this park is interesting as the sound of any music I could hear inside the concert hall. And I became fascinated by this kind of experience, and that's why I started carrying a tape recorder with me wherever I went, because whenever this sensation would occur, I wanted to document it in 
you know, record it. So I've got thousands of recordings of ambient sound in different places. And this seems to me to, to have a lot more unknowns to it than you know, writing music did, because I figured there were lots of people who could write music, but probably not so many people who would be interested in doing, doing this. And then I met John Cage in New York, and he agreed with me. And so I you know, pursued this uh, path. But I still, you know, love music, and but I don't, you know, I, I very seldom, you know, write music anymore. So the um, changing the perspective just a little bit. So, um, so we we have seen examples of uh, of a lot of work spanning a long sort of like development in in time. So. Uh, and and you talked about John Cage and uh, sort of like the link with the work kind of work that John Cage did. And uh, but do you see yourself as a kind of a lonely figure in a way on this kind of field that you are working in, or do you feel that there is some kind of a com community of artists doing uh, doing uh, sort of like related work? So I'm just curious about how you. So, sort of like, situate so yourself and, and and your your work in the sort of like field of culture and the arts. I think uh, I think when I started out, it was a very lonely uh, field, um, and I think now uh, it's very different because there's a huge interest in younger generations of artists. You know, and sound is a medium. It's uh, you know it's so easy to work with it as a medium today. And I had teaching experiences uh, in, in Europe, uh, especially with seminars where uh, we would kept, do all these field investigations and then they would go in the studio and make projects. And I mean, I think it's a medium that's becoming uh, more, more and more interesting and, you know, and important. And I, it feels very different today than it did when I started. As you as you reflect on that on that transition, could you talk about you? You've already expressed some wonderful insight in terms of how you, your observation of how the average person um, integrates sound into their experience. Could you talk? Could you describe if any a transition from from how you felt the general public? Um, experienced your work when you started as opposed to how they experience it now as the culture has changed? Well, <clears throat> I, I think uh, people today are exposed to so many varieties of uh, sounds in, uh, in the music, music they hear. The language of music is uh, so vastly com com complicated now compared to even what it was in the 60s. And people have access to so much uh, information about music. And, and um, I find that people have so much ac access to me. Because you know, on my website, I've got uh, hours and hours and hours of sounds that people can, can hear. So I, I think it's um, maybe the work I do today is less strange for people than it was when I when I started out. You still carry a tape recorder? Uh, yes. It's not a tape recorder anymore, it's a hard disk recorder. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Um, following on that technology question, is there a piece of technology that has come out in in your career that really impacted your work more than anything else? Well, I think just uh, sound recording devices of any, of any kind, really. And I, in my studio I have, you know, he has a collection of like all these projection devices and lighting devices. I've got a, the history of tape recorders in my studio going back to the 60s. And you know the sound recording device has really you know, been very, very important to me. 
The, the matrix mixer is a software-based mixer? It's hardware and software. It's hardware and software. It's a black box that has proprietary uh, software. Who is it made by? There's a couple of uh, companies that make them. Uh, the most expensive and best one is made by a company called LCS, Level Control Systems. And that's you know about a $30,000 mixer. Uh, there's a Canadian company called Richmond Sound that um, makes a pretty nice one that's at a third of the price of that. And there's a kind of open source uh, software that you can run on a, on a Macintosh called Super Collider that you can actually create a matrix software based matrix mixture with. And um, I've used that. And the, the nice thing about that is you can run it on any audio hardware platform. You, you can customize it in a way that the uh, kind of off-the-shelf matrix mixers don't do, but for like real reliable kind of permanent installations or long-term installations, probably the off-the-shelf matrix mixers are better to use because when super collider crashes, So we are, so it's uh, getting close to eight o'clock already. Uh, so uh, I think we might have time for a few more questions yet. If you, uh, anybody has something that you haven't had a chance to uh, ask or. I was curious about. Uh, yeah, I will give you the. <laughs> I was curious, um, looking on your menu screen, about the Pigeon project. Oh, you want to hear can them? you share that sure. one? Sure, sure I can. Thanks. Just give me a minute to reload the... Um, this, this is a piece uh, that was done for a new museum that was constructed in Cologne, Germany. The museum is uh, owned by the Catholic Archdiocese of Cologne and is called the Diocesan Museum. And they, uh, this museum uh, has uh, a collection of art that dates back to the Middle Ages, pre-war, pre-World War II. It was a collection of religious art, and after the Second World War, they started buying contemporary art. And they, uh, they ran out of space to put it in. They were in some ugly sort of post-war 50s building, and uh, they decided to commission uh, an architect, but I mean a Swiss architect, but I mean Peter Zumthor, to build a museum. And they put the museum on top of the ruin of a bombed-out Gothic church called St. Columba. And um, when they asked, me, they asked me to do a piece about the site of St. Columba, and I did an, a piece about acoustic, the acoustic memory of the place, which 10 years ago when I first saw it was a ruin that was inhabited by thousands of pigeons. So I made a lot of uh, multi-channel recordings of pigeons in the ruin of St. Columba, and then when they built this, uh, this, this space on top of the ruin, I uh, brought the sounds of the pigeons back into the space. So some of what I say will be on the text on this presentation, but you'll hear the pigeons and...
Any other any other questions? So maybe we could um, still take uh, one more question if uh, anybody has one. Okay, so you you get the last one. All right. Uh, well, um, you've showed us a lot of work about. Um, I guess is this on? Yeah, that has that has been uh, commissioned. Um, but I'm interested, and in, um, I'm interested in finding out if maybe you still had a dream project or something sketched away in a notebook somewhere that you've always well, I've, really wanted I've, to I've, do. I have lots of dream projects. Uh, <laughs> Anything in particular, maybe? Um, which one? Which one, you, which one do you think, Carol? <laughs> You, you, you know, you know, you know a lot of my dreams. Right. Um, well, I've one thing I, I always wanted to do in Los Angeles <coughs> I, that I'd never done um, is I used to be really interested, and I'm still interested, in how. Uh, objects listen to the world. And some of the very first sound sculptures I ever made involved placing acoustic microphones inside of resonators, large bottles, cylinders. And um, I always thought because you had free, all these cars always moving on freeways in Los Angeles that I wanted to do a sound piece um, where I would have a sequence of cylindrical resonators uh, along a freeway with microphones in them so that you would hear the motion of cars translated into the uh, resonators. Um, but I can play you, actually, if you want to hear it, a recording of like a piece that's like really, really old for me. It's like 1973. But it's a piece that the first sound sculptures I made in New York when I was a student involved putting these, putting resonators on the top of a building it was called the Experimental Intermedia Foundation. It was on uh, West Broadway and Spring Street. And I have these resonators on the roof of the building with microphones on them, and they transmit down to speakers inside the space. And it was basically the resonators listening to the, the, the sounds of the city. And I used to have the recording of one of the In New York? No, here in LA. Where do you think you have something Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the other thing I'd like to do in uh, Los Angeles uh, really relates to my interest in uh, seismic networks. Because uh, I, I described to you earlier uh, a project I'd done in the north of England at uh, Earth Sciences Department of Leeds University where I had access to a seismic network and uh, heard these amazing low-frequency sounds from the seismometers, which the geologists described as microseisms. And what these uh, are are the sounds of the uh, low-frequency sounds of the sea impacting the coast, traveling deep underground. And I had had some discussions uh, with the seismology department at UC Berkeley uh, about accessing their network, and. A piece of that would be interesting to do in Los Angeles uh, that would be theoretically possible is the seismologist said, my question was, would it be possible to correlate the acoustic sound of a breaking wave with its seismic echo? And he said yes. So one piece I would like to do somewhere in California, maybe in Los Angeles, if you can find somebody willing to pay for it. <laughs> It is a piece where you would hear in real time, you know, the acoustic sounds of the sea and you know, their seismic, seismic echoes. But I wanted to play you a last no sound from 1973, which is the bottle on the roof of a building in New York.
this sound sculpture, but it was very simple. Just a big bottle on the roof of this building transmitting to space to down the line. I think this was a very beautiful ending for the, for the lecture, Bill. And thank you very much, uh, Bill Fontana, for this um, review of quite, quite a lot of uh, amazing work. And uh, good luck for realizing these dream projects yeah. uh, that you talked about. Uh, so, Bill, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and I would, just uh, to finish, I would like to remind you that uh, this lecture, as well as all the other lectures or, organized by UCLA Design Media Arts, uh, are available on the uh, uh, DMA website. So you can, if you want to listen to this uh, lecture again, so you can just log on to our website and find the archive. So it's a, it's a huge resource of interesting, fascinating material uh, about media arts, design, technology, all these, all these connections. And as you know, it's, 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 it's accumulating. So we are adding things every week, so it's already hundreds of hours of material. So, uh, so if you want to go back to Bill's lecture, so 